Hi everyone, it's Raina. So this video is for the Blue Moon Lunar Eclipse in Leo, 11 degrees of Leo, which is happening on January 31st. And in my time zone, which is the central time zone in America, it's going to take place at 7.27 a.m. So it's going to be in the morning. And if you're in Europe, add about six hours to that or seven hours, I don't know, and it's all good. Australia, you're on your own. <laughs> I think that's. I think it's about 16 hours more than that. So anyway, somewhere along that time period. And the blue moon part, I think, is very intriguing for a lot of us because that term, once in the blue moon, implies rarity. And actually, there's going to be a blue moon in... March. On March, uh, is it the 31st too? So, and that one's in Libra, by the way. But I, I can't remember a time when there were two blue moons within a couple of months of each other. So, I don't know if that is um, portending something important in 2018, or if it's just random and not that big of a deal, but it seems to me that it's meaningful in some way. So I'm going to be using a new deck today that I actually got yesterday, and it's called the Wild Unknown Tarot. And I got this, uh, yes, I wasn't planning on getting this. I happened to have a gift certificate or gift card, and I was just trying to buy anything. And I didn't really want anything at this particular store that I went to. And you know how you get a gift card or, or you're returning things and you just, everything is so expensive or it's just not what you want. So you just try to get rid of it. That's kind of like what happened with me. Even though I was very grateful at the person who gave me the merchandise in the first place <clears throat> that I ended up returning. But... Um, in any case, I saw this and I paid like $40 for it. And of course, when I went on Amazon, it was on sale for like $24. <laughs> so, and I knew it. I was like, because most decks are only like 15 bucks. This one includes a little booklet, or it's, it's more than a little booklet. It's a bigger one, but still, uh, it's, it was quite expensive for those two items. However, um, when I was looking at the cards, I really love the depiction. So I'm going to kind of do a little test drive today with that deck and pick a few cards for this very um, auspicious lunar eclipse. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, before I do that, I want to just talk a little bit about the astrology of what's going on. Uh, some of you may not realize this, but anytime there's an eclipse, like a lunar eclipse is a full moon, but it's a very powerful full moon. So eclipses have, th this is what is said, the power of three full moons or new moons, depending, you know, solar eclipse would be new moons, obviously. And they have long-range effects. Some people say up to six months. Some people say up to a year after the actual date. At the time of any full moon, whatever the full moon is in, whatever degree it's in, it will be in a, an exact opposition with the sun at that time. So the full moon is 11 degrees of Leo. That means the sun is at 11 degrees of Aquarius. So what I just want to uh, talk about briefly is in the universal chart, what the houses of Leo and Aquarius represent. Leo represents the fifth house, which deals with romance, creativity, creative self-expression, um, conceiving children, recreational sex, your own business. Basically, anything that is creative that is coming from you 
including <laughs> another human being when you talk about children. And then you have the 11th house, which is the collective. So it is Aquarius, you think about the Aquarian age, where people care about one another and it's not just um, selfish about themselves. So that's the kind of opposition that is going on. Uh, and it's a humanitarian house, it's a house of friendships, a house of groups. The sun is in that 11th house. And the moon is what's in the fifth house. So the moon is a pale reflection, or you could say it's the shadow work that needs to be done. And with Leo, we're talking about the ego. And the reason I say this is because Leo is the sign, because it is about creative self-expression. It's ruled by the sun. The sun rules that fifth house, and the sun is central to our being, astrologically. This is why when you say, hey baby, what's your sign? You're not talking about the person's Venus sign or their rising sign, you're talking about their sun sign. Because the, the sun sign is the core of that person and it will um, really describe the person to the best of its ability astrologically without you knowing anything else about them. Now some people may argue with that and say that's not true. <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a Scorpio and everybody thinks I'm a Leo because I have Leo rising and, I'm, and I have Leo, you know, I don't know, Leo moon, something like that. That may be true up to a certain extent and people may get that impression about you, but when they get to know you better they will see that you are in fact a Scorpio. So the rising sign can be the first impression that you make and the moon sign can be your personality traits to a certain degree, but I would say especially the, the way that you emotionally react to life. But your sun sign will be what you value, the, your healthy ego, your, what you are into, and um, it's very important to honor that part of yourself because if you don't, if you're just the kind of person who um, is self-denying and doesn't want to, I don't know, go after your, your dreams, you may, you may suppress your, your sun sign, but it's going to come out eventually. And what I, what I'm, um, the reason I want to comment about this is because one of the shadow aspects of Leo is narcissism, self-absorption. And this comes about more often than not, I believe, when someone is a child and they do not get proper nurturing and proper attention is not placed on them. So they have to be the one to take care of their own needs in some ways. And it can lead to um, a hyper focus and over focus and it carries on throughout their lives. And if you've ever had the, <laughs> I'm going to call it the misfortune of dealing with people like this, it can be very um, unsettling and toxic because they tend to be rather arrogant and they tend to put down other people and act like they're better than other people. That's what arrogance is, obviously. And you could say that, yes, in fact, they are really insecure and they really don't love themselves. They really are feeling like they're not... Um, worth other people paying attention to, so they have to kind of be pushy and attention-seeking and things like that to get their needs met. But regardless, it can be very difficult to reason with such people. They have a tendency to be very stubborn in their way of doing things and thinking, even the way that they think. Interestingly, Leo is a fixed sign, just like uh, Aquarius is, 
just like Taurus is and just like Scorpio is. So people who are both narcissistic and a fixed sign, it can be like next to impossible to really get through to them. But that is a facet of narcissism in general is that they, you know, these people, I would say, are damaged goods. And I don't use that term lightly, but it's very difficult for people who are fractured to have the, what would you call it, the humility to admit that they need help. And that help can just be divine guidance. It doesn't have to be that they see a psychiatrist for 10 years, unless that's something that they want to do. But if you really humble yourself before God and, and pray to God and say, please help me to care about other people, to really want the best for other people, um, and not just to constantly be obsessed with my own needs getting met. Um, I believe that people, I believe anyone can change. But like I say, when someone is very damaged, they naturally reject any message that implies that they need to improve themselves. But they'll tell you that you need to improve yourself, uh, you know, all day, every day. So that's where it becomes problematic. And so with this um, polarity between Aquarius and Leo, ask yourself, have you found your tribe? Because that's what the 11th house is, about finding your tribe. And I'll just give you a personal example. I have both Saturn and Chiron in the 11th house. And when I was growing up, I never felt like I belonged. Okay, I just, I was mixed ethnicity. Um, I was, uh, you know, I just had, there were things about me that were just different. I mean, now I look back and I say, you know, now that I'm doing this, everything comes together because I was very creative. I was artistic in my own way. And that was not the norm. The norm was to do sports. The norm was to do the, and to be good at it. And I was a spaz, you know, I, I don't mean that I shouldn't, you know, use that word. I don't think that's a very politically correct word, but I was very awkward. I was a geeky little girl, very skinny and geeky and didn't know how to play softball didn't, you know, always got stuck in, you know, <laughs> left field or someplace really far back. I'm, I'm actually left-handed. Well, ambidextrous. I do, you know, I, I use both hands, but I just have always thought about things in a different way. And as a result, I never felt like I belonged to any particular clique. Um, and the way that I healed that, because Chiron in, in the house can indicate where um, you need healing. And I feel like by doing this type of work, I have healed myself because Chiron is actually about healing um, others and healing yourself at the same time. When you heal yourself, you're capable of helping other people in a very profound way. And in the 11th house, it's all about belonging, that feeling of finding your tribe. And since I, ha I have Saturn in that house, I know that it's a delayed thing. It's like uh, Saturn deals with older age, okay, maturity. So all of these things, you know, there's that saying, all good things come to he who waits or she. And I think that, you know, the 11th house, when I was initially learning about the houses, that was where the, in, the internet was connected to the 11th house. Now they're saying the third house because that's communication. But the 11th house with the Aquarian connection, because Uranus deals with technology, and the 11th house deals with the collective, that's where the internet 
comes in. I would say both of those houses matter and should be looked at when we're talking about the internet. And I feel that that's where I've made my connections with people because I'm introverted and I know a lot of people who use the internet are, they really resonate with the internet because they like to, they want to socialize, but they don't necessarily feel comfortable doing it in the traditional way. So this can be uh, a time for you to reach out uh, because we are going to have a solar eclipse in this 11th house a couple of weeks after this blue moon lunar eclipse happening in the fifth house in Leo. So these are bookend bookends with these two signs. And um, the the point that I'm trying to make is that with the with the lunar eclipse in the fifth house, we're talking about looking at the ways which you can throw out your ego, the toxic part of your ego. That's like I me mine that doesn't consider other people, that's just interested in getting your own needs met. So, and then in that two week period, reflecting on that, and then you're ready for that new moon in the 11th house, where it's kind of this um, new beginning with groups. Maybe you do find your tribe in the coming months. And it's like a homecoming where you are with people who understand you, who get you. This isn't about psychophants, about people uh, who are just agreeing with everything you say. But it's that you have similar interests and temperaments. The other thing that I just want to go through some of these other um, signs or you know these planets that are going to be affected so mercury is in capricorn at 29 degrees on this day poised to go into aquarius like venus is in aquarius and there's actually a conjunction between the sun and venus um i think that for people who are looking for love this could be actually a very good time even though it's a lunar eclipse in the fifth house it may really illuminate for some of you who are kind of dense that there's somebody in your life who is worth giving attention to that maybe you kind of have um, passed off as just a friend we have to be careful at this time about our desires that we're not being unrealistic because both the sun and moon as well as Venus, form squares to Jupiter, which can, you know, be something overblown. And it can make things a lot less realistic. Venus is in Aquarius, as I said, and Mars is in Sagittarius. And both of these signs are very, they're masculine signs, as is the Sun and Moon with uh, Aquarius and Leo. And so, male or female... There's this desire for freedom within the realm of relationships, uh, of not feeling like if you are in a relationship, that means you have to give up yourself. And this is an important thing because the collective, the group, of course that's important, but the self is important as well. And I don't mean to um, belittle anyone who feels a need to break away from some sort of um, relationship that the other person denies your own characteristics. If, they, if you're in that type of relationship, you may have a revelation during this period that enough is enough and that you are uh, tired of being asked to take a back seat to the other person, but more than just the other person, other people. And um, maybe you have a partner who is more interested in their friendships than you, and they would do anything for their friends, and you're like chopped liver to them. So 
that may come up, like, what about me? That's not being narcissistic. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. So uh, let me just get to the cards. I'm going to pick, as I said, maybe um, two cards from this new deck of mine. And then, um, and I'll link that deck if I remember. And then I'm going to pick a card from the Keepers of the Light Oracle, which is one of my go-to decks. And um, maybe one from the Ascended Masters, from Doreen Virtue. I mean, I haven't done that in a long time. I want to show you the backs of these cards, the new deck I have, which is kind of interesting. Um, they're, they're matte. They're not glossy. And at first, I was a little bit... I was a little bit, I don't know if disappointed is the word, because I was concerned that they would be too flimsy. But as I feel the cards, they feel rather sturdy, even though they're matte. So, um, and they feel good in my hand, you know. Sometimes these cards are a little bit oversized. So, okay. And, you know, I'm going to have to guess on these, because they do use different um, lingo here. Daughter of Cups, I'm, a, I'm imagining is is um page of cups i'll have to look in the booklet just to double check that's what i'm thinking but very interesting artwork and i'm going to pick one more hmm interesting the world isn't this cool it's like um they're like sketches you know like pen drawings or something ink drawings but they're different enough that you can, you know, differentiate between them, which I like. You know, sometimes you get these decks and everything is the same in the backwards. I think I'm just going to pick one from my Akashic Tarot, to be honest with you. Initiation of the Count Saint Germain. Now, that is interesting because I don't think I've ever gotten this card before. And uh, this deck is called a tarot deck, but it's not like a traditional tarot deck, so... Just to make that clear. <laughs> I got this for another reading, interestingly, so that I just did one of my bliss reports. Okay. So let me just double check about that Daughter of Cups. It's obviously, okay. Yeah, I'm thinking it's Page of Cups, okay? Daughter of Cups. Um, okay. So, when we think of Page of Cups, we're talking about energy that is highly idealistic and creative. A lot of times with the Page of Cups, there can be new relationships that are taking root. And yet the person has to really watch out for a tendency to be overly trusting, leading to gullibility issues. And as I said, there is this square between Venus and Jupiter. And it can lead the person to exaggerate um, a romantic feeling that they have. Because the sun and the moon are also squaring, squaring Jupiter. So blowing things out of proportion. But also not having like a grounded understanding of a particular relationship 
it's great for artistic pursuits because even when people kind of go wild in that sense, they can be quite prolific. They can come up with some amazingly original work. And that, you know, just because something is a square doesn't mean that it can't help you. It's just that you have to contend with certain frustrations that are inherent in that contact of those two planets. And then we have here the world. And the world is a major arcana card. It's the last one in the major arcana. And so it's talking about the end of a cycle. And I think that, you know, look, uh, hello, um, lunar, blue moon, lunar eclipse. We're talking about an ending with an exclamation point. You would have to look in your natal chart to find out where exactly this lunar eclipse is going to affect you. Um, and it requires bringing up your chart because it's dependent on the degree of your, you know, uh, of, uh, th this is happening at 11 degrees of Leo, but 11 degrees of Leo is not going to fall in the same house as everyone with Leo rising, for instance. So, um, in any case, the world card also, I think, is about tying up loose ends. And I've been saying this a lot lately, and I think it's because there are a lot of transitions that are happening, and yet not everyone is on board with this. Some people are resisting change, and as a result, they are finding themselves um, having new experiences, but also being held back because they're not dealing with old situations that they need to really put behind them. And usually it will be relationships like um, romantic relationships that they are kind of keeping on life support and it's dragging them down, but they don't know how to just totally let go. With a lunar eclipse, sometimes the universe makes that decision for you, <laughs> just to make it clear. Okay, now we're going to look at the initiation of St. Germain, and this is number 14. Let me hold up the card while I'm reading the description of it. Standing among the pillars within a beautiful temple, the Ascended Master Count St. Germain sends his light and energy to the four robed people who stand before him. It is time for their initiation. This card represents your initiation. It is much more than a change or even a transformation. It's nothing less than your movement into higher revelations of power, insight, and achievement. And the time is now. Some loss of lower vibration relationships, jobs, or activities may be required in order to lift you to the new heights and power that await you. Your initiation can be aided by meditation and study as well as by connecting to the Ascended Masters with whom you have worked for centuries upon centuries. Know that you have shared purposes and activities with the Masters, even if you aren't certain of what they are yet. The disciplines you create now during your initiation and the work you do with the Masters will lift your service to the world and to all humankind. This is a time of um, enormous uplifting, first in your energy and evolution, then in your manifest outer reality. The power that you hold within will impact every part of your life. That is very inspirational to me because I think that we are definitely um, experiencing an upgrade in consciousness in our vibration and things like that. But sometimes it doesn't feel that way because there's so, it's like so much swirling around. And I think you know what I mean. That it, it almost seems like a step backwards at times with some of the emotions that are expressed, but 
ultimately, I think we are moving forward. We are evolving spiritually. And I guess it's really a time to embrace this and not procrastinate any longer in making those necessary changes that are going to enhance your your life, uh, you know, in this incarnation. And then the last card is Kuan Yin. Choose to be love. Do what is right for everyone involved. Offer a helping hand. Okay, so let's talk about what Kuan Yin represents. Kuan Yin, it's um, usually spelled Q-U-A-N, but some people spell it K-U-A-N, is, in a, of course, Y-I-N, is a bodhisattva, Buddha-like being, and, a, and the goddess of mercy, compassion, and love. Though she's acknowledged in Buddhism and the traditions of China, she goes beyond religion and warms the hearts of all who call on her. She has a strong connection to healing energy, in particular Reiki, and encourages people to offer care, forgiveness, and compassion to themselves and others. Compassion is about recognizing the spirit in others. It's about seeing that they come from the same source as you do. First of all, the Keepers of the Light want to acknowledge all the service and commitment you have offered to others. You are all love. If you are finding it difficult with anyone at the moment, the best way you can move forwards is to go beyond wanting to understand why or how they are the way that they are. Just move, just move beyond their behavior, mistakes, and challenges. This card brings a message of friendship and care, helping you see that those around you do have the best intentions, even if it doesn't always seem that way. Move into compassion and develop a greater understanding. This will elevate your spirit and connection to love. <clears throat> just knock something over. Um, I just want to add my own two cents. I don't necessarily believe. I think sometimes people um, are destructive. I mean, I don't think everybody is always doing things with the best of intentions. And I'm sorry if that sounds cynical. I think it's more realistic. And I think it's, you know, to... It's, you know, I'm, I believe that as a self-protective measure, because if I just believe everyone has my best interest at heart, I may be unpleasantly surprised when they um, say certain things, and I'll just assume that they really are being genuine, and they're not. Some people are, are envious, some people are, you know, they don't, they're confused with their own life, so they don't know how to um, help, you know, they don't know how to not be envious when they see other people and compare themselves to like you, if you have any of these people in your life. And I do feel like it's important to try to understand where they're coming from, because I think that can set you free when you don't, when you just think that uh, <laughs> they're just doing it and there's no rhyme or reason that can lead to a lot of confusion. And um, I just think, well, this person, they may be thinking that this is how they can make themselves happy, but they don't realize that they're hurting themselves by this behavior. But I'm going to try to, um, you can say, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to hold them in the best light that I can, but you may decide that there are certain people that you can't associate with very often because you just don't um, feel that there's um, a positive energy flow coming from them. And I, that's one of the things, um, too, about this eclipse is letting go of anything that doesn't honor yourself. Leo is a sign of dignity. And when there's an imbalance in a person, let's say if they, a person happens to have a sun or another prominent planet in Leo, an imbalance for them um, can lead to arrogance or 
to being very low in self-esteem and not having much of a backbone. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about having this sense of um, what you deserve. And that, to me, is very important. Okay, you guys. Well, let's see what happens. This should be a very interesting astrological transit. And uh, all the best to you. Take care. Bye.